Hello, welcome everybody to the Rojas Report. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, just real quick, you know, uh, for those of you who are here, it's because you're the higher level patron, the intergalactic planetary, and you have access to everything. Uh, you know, all the live videos, all the videos. The only thing that you would have to subscribe to separately would be my YouTube archive of these videos. But you don't need to do that because you can come here to Crowdcast. I have a link, too, at the top. And you know what? I'll provide more links all over the place. Because if you go straight to Crowdcast, you're going to be able to see all the videos. And that way you don't have to go searching through them through Patreon posts or anything like that. Just one stop. See all the videos. See all my upcoming live videos. And so you guys rock because you get access to everything. Um, otherwise, if you're a podcaster and you also want to hear the audios, this is a real cool new feature from Patreon. There's an RSS feed. So if you go to your, when you're looking at my Patreon page, you'll have a membership tab. And if you go there, you've got a custom RSS feed that's going to, you can put in your whatever you use for podcasts, Apple, whatever. And uh, it'll subscribe to all of them, the premium and the uh, the Friday newscast that I do for free for people. Um, so you'll have access to everything. So you guys are the top dog. So thank you so much for being here. That means you're going to be able to ans ask questions. And tonight's one where I think you're really going to want to ask questions because we have an incredible guest. One of my favorite guests, of course, if you've been listening to my podcast or watching my interviews, I have uh, Colonel John Alexander quite a bit just because I think he's someone that should be, uh, you know, referenced or spoken to and asked questions and, and sh to share information about all of this stuff that's been happening more than he is. And I think, unfortunately, you know, I think people, uh, if you're not talking about secret alien, you know, stashes of aliens and, and deep uh, dark corridors then uh, a lot of people aren't as interested but we're interested in the more credible real world type of stuff so that's why we have colonel john alexander now typically i don't do a, a long intro for practically anybody because i like to get to the info but there are a couple of things that are in uh, john's background that i think are really important such as he was a colonel in the United States Army for a long period of time where he worked with Army intelligence. He was also an inspector general. And I think that's a really important point because it was his job to audit and make sure essentially, and he can give us more uh, info about this, to make sure that everybody's following the proper procedures and protocols, which means he would know the proper procedures and protocols uh, when it came to a lot of, uh, you know, what the Army was doing. He also was the director of the U.S. Army Advanced Concepts Lab. Um, after he retired, he went to work at uh, Los Alamos, where he was a program manager for their uh, for non-lethal defense. And he's become a, a prominent non-lethal weapons expert and consultant. Um, he also helped establish the National Institute for Discovery Sciences with Robert Bigelow, which was the precursor to BASS, where the program that worked with ATIP, the Pentagon UFO project. And uh, so John was there at the beginning when they began researching Skinwalker Ranch and some of those other things. He also has two books, UFOs, Myths, Conspiracies, and Realities, one of my absolute favorite books in the UFO uh, field. And then also a newer book where he gets into some of the other uh, kind of esoteric things that he's into, reality denied firsthand experiences with things that can't happen but did. And there's one more thing that I did not mention. And actually, let me bring uh, John onto the screen here and talk about this one. So John, while you were in intelligence, you had gathered together a bunch of your colleagues, uh, some in intelligence, but government officials. And I think you, you required that they all have clearances uh, and your task, I guess, was to go look for the government UFO secrets. Is that correct? That's basically it. Yeah. No, the time frame was a little off. This was back while I was still uh, um, active duty. I, I had retired in uh, 88, so it was uh, from about 82 on. Mm -hmm. And so I guess to begin with, what are your thoughts on the latest news that the Senate is now requesting uh, the Senate Intelligence Committee, uh, led by Marco Rubio in particular, are asking the services uh, 
tasking specifically the ONI to organize this, the uh, Office of Naval Intelligence, to get U UAP information from all of the agencies, including the S FBI. Well, long overdue. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, I know, Lou Alessandro, you've probably had him on uh, as well. And you see that. And uh, I, what Lou did, when I was here earlier, give him credit because he was more successful than I was when we tried to transition to a formal program. Uh, that's where we ran out. Uh, as you know, I went up to SDI, the Strategic Defense Initiative, or sometimes called Star Wars, and had asked them for money. And at that time, they just said, this is a bridge too far, uh, that they were under threat. They had a $5 billion budget. Congress was, was after them. We were looking for something to formalize the program. And... Uh, it didn't happen. I got uh, a, uh, an assignment that uh, I, I could refuse and did, and then retired. And as you know, then you mentioned going to Los Alamos for following that. We did hold a couple of sessions, though, uh, after I left uh, at Lanel, and um, I lived in Santa Fe at the time and uh, had a number of the folks uh, in there. Sorry for the video quality, everybody. I know it's it's kind of low and it's it's kind of John's. It's coming in and out. Luckily, the audio is working. So, and I think the conversation is really important. So, we'll definitely keep going. But uh, and it, the conversation is important because, like I mentioned earlier, you did this and kind of like you mentioned, you tried to do this. And and Elizondo's gotten a little further. Of course, he's had the help of Chris Mellon, which is no small thing. Huge. But what is it that you think the Senate will find um, if, well, and do you think these agencies will actually provide this report, of course, if this bill that uh, this request is in passes? Um, that's a very, very interesting question and hard to say. Um, and what they will provide um, now, as you know, you've probably all seen the videos that were out there from the Nimitz group and the stuff that happened over in the Gulf and uh, on the East Coast as well. Uh, that was all Navy. Uh, very, very recently, the last two or three days, we saw the Air Force come up and admit that they may have some things. They have been very reticent to acknowledge anything in the field. Now, one of the problems is people don't like to address issues they don't have the answer to. Now, this uh, certainly is not close, to, as I said, in the UFOs. Now, I don't think we're at the point of asking the right questions, much less getting uh, simple answers. As I say, we're looking at something that's probably more complex uh, than cancer. Um, hopefully they will come and, and the one thing I would hope uh, comes out of this is that we see through the Congress that um, some more of the videos get released and we get more detail on the cases that they have had uh, access to. I mentioned uh, that um, we something popped up there um, uh, not a lot has changed. Remember, the incidents have been occurring uh, certainly since 47 and before, and as we know, sightings go back to millennia. Uh, what I think is different now from the time when we were working is you have more advanced sensors, particularly space-based sensors, and uh, um, they're better. So maybe we have some higher quality uh, data that will be available. And, and my position is that I think it ought to be a made available public, uh, particularly to research institutions that have the capability to, uh, you know, do the analysis necessary. When, so Chris Mellon wrote an article in The Hill where he kind of called out for very similar verbiage that is in this request. Uh, that was about a year ago or a few months back. Uh, and something that is in this request that wasn't in what Chris Mellon talked about is this public 
portion. He had mentioned, and and you know, some of the systems I think you have mentioned here are classified. And he had talked about how it be, you know, most of this information is classified, so it'd have to be a classified report to the Senate Intel Senate Intelligence Committee. But you know, in their request, they definitely stress that we realize a lot of this information is classified, but we want a public report, something that they can release to the public. Um, that's sort of interesting. I mean, is there going to be, is there much, you know, even with what you're talking about now, that would be able yeah. to be released? Maybe just summaries of information? Yeah, certainly. Yeah. Um, one of the, I guess, the key issues in the sensitivity has to do with the sensor systems themselves and what are their operational capabilities. Uh, that's something you really don't want to give away. I, how good are our sensors actually? Um, you also don't like to give away vulnerabilities of our operational military systems. And, um, and we correspond friendly, I, I disagree, but in fairness, when I was running the program 30 years ago, I couched it in exactly the same terms that he did. In fact, in the book, I put in uh, some of these issues, and that is the threat. Uh, the you know, military needs to be able to determine these things because of the threat. Now, the reason for doing that is that it is the Department of Defense. The Department of the United States from threats. So if you want to get money from them, what you need to do is to couch whatever information they're providing in terms of being a threat. Um, it, it's useful from a funding perspective, and it, it justifies, uh, from a defense perspective, being able to do this, and so we, we need to understand that, as opposed to just period interest. You know, the strange things that happen all the time that are not couched in terms of threat. Um, and probably the government has no business being involved. I go into the religious issue, for instance, and say, you know, you have no expectation that the government is going to validate religion, miracles, or anything like that. As you know, my background in near death and continuation of consciousness is an area that certainly is, is of interest, but I do not see the Defense Department getting involved. By couching it as a threat, that is viable for the government to be spending money on it. Right, right. And I think that's a really good point. And I think it, you know, it makes sense, but it seems like a lot of people get hung up on that, that oh, why are we assuming, you know, this is all a bad thing? It, it, it you know, it, it could be benign. Um, no one seems to have been hurt. At least some people feel that way. Some feel otherwise. I think uh, even Robert Bigelow has said something like he, he believes maybe people have been hurt. Um, but I think that, you know, in order to get funding, right, it, it, it's a threat. And, um, Ben Hansen, I've said this many times, but Ben Hansen puts it really well. If you woke up in the morning and you saw footsteps in your kitchen, um, you would be frightened. You even if that person who came in was was innocent, you know, if it was Santa Claus or whatever, you would you would be you would consider that a threat and a security issue. Right, and again, you've got to remember, and one of the things that's not understood. By most people, it's not going to really work. And then again, you have the Department of Defense, they have responsibility for handling the defense of the nation. So you're going to spend funds based on that there's a potential threat there. And now they do get into, and other agencies as well, in things like fundamental physics. And certainly what we observed in the UFO phenomena. Uh, defies the laws of physics as we know it. I mean, you see, you know, terms, no human could survive under normal uh, circumstances. So the question becomes, you know, how do you do that? And if you had such a capability, on um, the plus side, it would give you a big advantage. Conversely, you worry about a potential adversary 
uh, achieving such a capability, which would give them a uh, substantial leap in uh, their offensive or defensive capability. I think that's another important point in that uh, people kind of think of it as a discovery thing. Oh, it's going to be interesting to know what's going on and what these things are. But uh, from a military perspective, they have a much different uh, point of view. So first of all, the security issue. But like you said, the other issue being the tech, that if there's tech here, um, you know, they want to figure that out. In fact, uh, Nick Pope, I think, who worked with the UK government has put it that at times it seemed like, you know, really many people's driving force was understanding whatever tech was being di demonstrated by these foreign objects, uh, wherever they came from. Um, that was their big concern is they want to understand that tech and, and get some of it. Well, let me put this in a military perspective. Uh, you remember the invasion of Iraq. Now, uh, Iraq had uh, Soviet, which was still a bad old day, but they had uh, Soviet air defense systems, and we were able to take them down in minutes. Now, our guess is uh, that from a technological ten years ahead. So if we could you know, decimate a sophisticated technical air defense system with a near 10 year leap, imagine what it is if we keep talking about 100 or 1,000 years uh, in advance. In other words, a great technological leap. And, and that is something uh, to be concerned about and worthy of study. Mm -hmm. So, when it comes to other governments, when you looked into, I guess we should have you kind of maybe uh, characterize what it is you felt uh, your team discovered uh, when you looked for the, the UFO secrets, um, so to say, uh, back in the 80s. Um, yeah. What did you find you know, the United States stance was, or what do you think they knew? Well, uh, mainly that they had the same questions we did. Uh, we were, had the capability to listen to uh, many of their internal dialogues. Uh, I guess the main thing is they were having similar patients as we were, uh, that they had many of the same concerns. Of course, now they were concerned that it might be ours for the technological leap, or we were concerned it might be theirs, where they are at the time with a uh, technological uh, leap. Um, but internally, uh, yeah, there was a lot of uh, discussion. Now, I do want to point out there was also a lot of skepticism uh, in their systems as well as ours. One of the things we tend to do in the whole sci arena, it, it looks like it works between us and, and the Soviets. And uh, yeah, they had some big advantages, but they also were faced with major skeptics. And that was true in the UFO arena as well. Mm -hmm. And did you, I mean, there's a part of this that is kind of like, you know, the issue we had at 9-11 with, uh, with intelligence in general. Um, but this issue with, you know, a lack of communication, a lack of coordination. And that's certainly something that was addressed Absolutely. in that request. Uh, and, you know, was that something you had also witnessed back in the 80s? Oh, absolutely. Uh, that was kind of across the board. Remember, information is knowledge or power. So he who holds the information, it, it puts you in a powerful position. Um, so getting a, uh, these organizations to share is a really, really difficult thing. And of course, 9-11 brought that before the agencies did not communicate, and in fact, in some cases, were prohibited from communicating uh, internally. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, again, you're back to a situation where nobody understands what's going on, and you hate to appear too uh, too ignorant. I will tell you that in the group that uh, that I formed, I had representatives from uh, all of the services, uh, from. Uh, various intelligence agencies and from advanced to aerospace what they found was that they, knew, they had to have personal interests so but they all knew the basic background 
uh, but uh, everybody sort of turned around and said, well, I thought you did that, you know, pointing fingers at, at others. Here's a question um, that's sort of interesting, and this is regarding, because uh, it kind of fits. So, for example, there are, uh, Cash Landrum in particular, you feel that perhaps there was a uh, technology, not ours, that was a kind of hologram or projecting. Um, one of the people who asked the question here, they say, do you think there is a possibility that the UAPs, such as the Tic Tac video you previously discussed, might be in whole or part another country's equivalent to our own much rumored Project Blue Beam, um, getting us to try to chase their holograms? Um, a millennia ago? Again, you've got to go back and look at this from a historical perspective, not just the current events, but these events have been seen for decades and in literally centuries and, and millennia. So when you start talking about is this a come some kind of a, an advanced technological leap, um, that does not answer the question, and particularly when you put it in historic perspective. Right. When um, you know another question that this uh, it's entered is his name, and he has another great question because you were talking about you know the technology is improved. Uh, so for instance, um, being able to uh, you know remote view with that satellites uh he's asking do you think the x-37b space planes long duration orbital flights have anything to do with studying unidentified aerial phenomena or it's more likely studying terrestrial items of interest or satellites for defense purposes i would put it very definitely in the terrestrial basis now that does not preclude as we have seen with all these other systems, that they don't have some kind of interaction. But, but I, I don't think it's a primary mission or anything like that. And I think uh, much as what you've seen with the Navy, uh, I'm guessing that you will probably see some sort of uh, interaction. Uh, the data will be there. Uh, they'll probably be very sensitive about releasing that sort of stuff. But I would put it in a relatively high probability um, just like satellites and everything has been up there, that some sort of interaction will be observed. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, uh, there was a really interesting uh, discussion at the Scientific Coalition for UAP Research Conference last year in Alabama, where there was a satellite expert, and he had talked about how most, a lot of these companies now, the big goal is to record everything. So literally those things, their cameras are open recording all the time. And the it the uh, goal is to record everything. And then they provide the data for corporations to go back and review whatever it is they wanted to look at at whatever time, um, same with military. And so they would have that ability. Uh, and which would mean that it could be a good source for information on UO, UAP issues because you would be able to go back and, and look at, you know, the video camera data um, yeah. during a period of time. Uh, if you were, your perspective on this, because it does mean, you know, that's the type of thing they might be asking about, uh, you know, when the ONI or whoever is tasked with doing this, um, going and asking all of these departments, what do you got? Is it possible if there is a department, let's say there's a, you know, Space Command or now it's Space Force or whatever, somebody's got look satellites like this and they've had these UAP incidents. If they are reticent to share that information, um, will they be right would be required to? Do you think there could be situations in which they don't feel like they want to give up the information and thus will hold back? Or do you think that uh, they might not have that concern? They might just do it in well, fear of getting in trouble? That, that's not a, a, a simple as it sounds. Remember, no out in the Air Command, you know, with the satellites out there. They pick stuff up. Now, there was a problem that I know existed that the operators who were, you know, monitoring the sensor systems learned pretty quickly that reporting things that you couldn't explain was not what we call career enhancing. In other words, 
there's a significant uh, interest in not providing uh, information on that. What we have to do uh, is to make it okay to do that. And that's one of the is having, as you have now, let's say with the Senate requirement and that, but it's kind of more public and say, you know, hey, it's really okay to report things that you don't fully understand. And we'll hopefully they will do it. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, my last assignment, as you mentioned, I was director of advanced system concepts at what was then laboratory command. My commander was a two star who had just come from NORAD, uh, where he had been a ship commander. They had a, a brigadier who was the, the ship commander, you know, the, the highest ranking guy on there. And, and um, I tell you, he was an understatement. Um, and so it was clear that when you, you're talking at that level, um, not going to have this happen. And lower level, this has happened, but I don't think I want to pass those kind of data up. Got to make it permissible to do that. Mm -hmm. Sort of like that was, I think, the important thing with the Navy message that there were, um, that they take it seriously and that they were revamping the uh, UAP reporting protocols. It seems like a big part of that uh, announcement was just signaling to the to everyone that it's okay to report this information. And that's critical. That is absolutely critical and about the only way that we're going to be able to advance. Uh, I will say in my era, you know, what we found across the board, you had individuals who were interested. We communicated internally. Um, I'll tell you about NSA. I uh, had friends from there. There were message traffic in there. It didn't go any place. And actually, people said, oh, Hal McConnell, we'll give you a guy's name, was the one who was interested, and the stuff would go and be put in his seat. Now, a lot of that would be routinely destroyed, and for good reason. There's lots and lots of things that are just uh, destroyed. Um, but then it was not something that was widely uh, disseminated at all. And you almost had to have, somebody had to know who Hal was, if he was interested, and to get the data to him. And that's, I guess, another piece of it is that, um, you know, where the information is and how it's been shared or not, or if it remains. I mean, if, and, and you can tell me if this, you know, sounds like it's it's accurate at all if there are departments out there who occasionally ran across this data like you said it's not career enhancing they may have not logged it or you know logged it and dogged it you hear or the, the information just could be lost because they just didn't feel it was important enough to um you know uh, to save it well one of the things that has happened is with uh, their it systems uh, an electronic data storage, which is you know much more uh, capable than you have in the days we had. Everything was literally hard copy of you know, some kind. Towards um, the issues we have now, and this refers back to the question that you had about the civilian satellite. You know, the whole uh, system of intelligence now called OSINT, or open source intelligence. Uh, what they're doing is scanning. The best. And the, one of the problems with Ozen is there is so much information that you've got to have the right filters and to recognize the information that you want and bring it to the place where it can be stored and, and analyzed. Uh, but um, I, I think, again, uh, that we didn't have just three, four decades ago. If you were one of the guys, I want to ask your question on, on both sides of this. If you were, you know, you were headed up one of these departments, and of course you have been in charge of various departments, and you were approached by, let's say it's the ONI or someone with the um, DNI that is asking you, hey, we would like your UAP files. Um, what would your reaction be? Would you be reticent to share that or would you be excited to? Um, or, you know, did you ever even have any? 
Well, that again would be, um, it's, it's actually a very interesting question, and I, because one of the things you didn't articulate is what agency? Remember, mm -hmm. there is something called the golden rule. And he who has the gold makes the rules. The way you get the gold is by controlling information and data flow and, and that. So you may be interested in doing it. Now, here's where you run into the conundrum. And again, the 9-11 thing. Uh, do you share data? Yeah, because it's for the good. Do I want to assert a piece of that information? Uh, because I'm going to use this and able to enhance my position and literally my budget. Hmm. So, I wasn't sure if you got cut off there. Are you still there? Yes. Okay. So, yeah. I mean, and one of the things you're kind of alluding to is this intelligence or this information is kind of, it has currency. It holds currency. Absolutely. Um, and in that situation, they could, do you think it would be advantageous for any organization to hint that they do have some, but also give the impression that they have quite a bit, but they're just going to share a little tidbit here um, to kind of, you know, bolster themselves. Like you said, hopefully, you know, make it look like they uh, have projects in this arena that um, are fruitful uh, to hopefully bolster their position to get money uh, for these projects. Uh, do you think that's a possible scenario? Okay, you're cutting out a bit, but I think I can follow uh -oh. that. Uh, let's distinguish, though, between providing information in the civilian sector and that that you might do internally, because your approach could be really quite different uh, from that. Hmm. Because I don't care about the civilian sector from a uh, an institutional perspective. But my, that's not where I get my money from. Money is a finite source. And what people don't realize is... is the budgeting process is terribly, terribly complex. And the way you approach it is you have a one to end priority list of all the things that you want to do. Now, it also depends on, in that organizational structure, what are your primary requirements? If this falls within primary requirements, then you can raise the priority level. But basically, what you do is you come down to all the things you must do, then things you want to do, then things you'd like to do. And based on your money, you go down. And like I say, you run out of money long before you get through the list of, of things you'd certainly like to do. And the only time I saw that violated was after 9-11 uh, in the SOCOM arena, Special Operations Command, where they did start dumping so much money that they didn't know how to spend it. Uh, but that is extraordinarily rare and not something you're going to find in, in current budget. Um, so it's got to be something that your organization is responsible for. You can, you know, and getting, getting you back, you'd like to make a threat. And it had some problem. And that's one thing we haven't discussed. Okay, if you're going to do this and you're a steward of, let's say, a large part of money, uh, whatever that is, um, when you say we're going to get into research and development, one of the issues is, okay, what's your probability of success? Because you're going to fund things that you think you can't get an answer to. One of the problems in the UFO arena, you look at things that are so far out, yeah, you'd like to know what that is, but I don't care how much money I give you or who we give it to at this point, you know, uh, what's my probability of answers? Now, as mentioned earlier, I think this is at least as complex as cancer. And you look at the amount of money we, we put into cancer. Can you say it's a serious? No, it's not killing people, you know, like, uh, like cancer does. But certainly the scientific questions are on that level of complexity. So if I apply actually against sort of that, what's the probability I'm going to be able to solve it? And that is part of the equation that you would have you know, from an institutional perspective uh, for funding these questions. Mm -hmm. And then you also have the situation of Elizondo and ATIP in which it was kind of a passive program in that they didn't have to spend money. 
They just needed a guy to keep his ear open and ears and eyes open and gather information that was collected by other agencies and kind of crunch those numbers and, and crunch that information and, and put it but together. Been, sorry, you, you cut out there. Um, therein lies a lot of the problem. And that was, how do you find the right set of people? Now, we were doing that to a very, very minor degree based on the people that I had. Now, this was 35 years ago. Uh, again, and getting data sharing that they wanted to uh, you know, get information from one institution uh, to another. Uh, but, and again, if you went up the food channel, the heads of phone, Lou found out you had to have the right people at whatever level it is who were uh, willing to even explore it. Uh, I gave one of these briefings. <laughs> I was talking to some uh, major general, happened to be an army major general about these topics. And it was kind of interesting because his response was, look, you can talk to this to generals, but don't talk to colonels. And his point mm -hmm. there, there was uh, what's called the 06 cross, the Colonel Crust, who came up with, you know, I hear like things and you waves and I'm not gonna allow waves to be uh, caused again. And he felt, and I do not fully agree with this now, is that generals in general tended to be more open-minded to some of these things. Um, I, I don't think he was right on that, but, but the concept of, it, it would be more, don't talk to, you know, talk to people who have institutional responsibilities who are Likely to be Nope, you cut out there a little bit. Um, what was that last thing? Uh, I said you, you would want to provide. You know, the idea was to provide. If you're going to provide information, you want to do it to somebody who's going to be receptive. And mm. I've got to say, I did a number of briefings, and as some of you know, I got to very, very high levels uh, in the government. And I never once had a negative response with one notable uh, his name, but he had been DDRD, the Deputy Director for Research and Engineering, which is a very high level in the, the uh, Pentagon. Uh, he was now retired and running one of these external science boards. And I gave UFOs 101 for a couple hours that went seemingly pretty well. And then he asked, are there any questions? And I got a couple of questions. Then he jumped up and said, you're not supposed to know that. That's what you learn when you die. <laughs> and it's a little point of with him. Um, I picked up my slides and tried to get out there. So, oops, I thought we were in a science meeting. But, uh, but the point is, you do, the people come in uh, with preset notions, and some of them are religious. Uh, mm -hmm. We haven't met that, and Lou has bumped into that, and certainly in the remote viewing program, uh, we ran into that, where people said, yes, you can do that, but you shouldn't, because that's the work of the devil. Mm -hmm. Right, so this might occur. Well, and you know, some of the other things, kind of getting back to the, the other hurdles that they may run into is, uh, is it a detriment that they put in there that they want to have a public side of this? Because um, it would seem that, like you said earlier, if, if really their their main thing is is looking for to increase their budgets, uh, and so they're looking, they're more apt to share any information in a classified uh, level. Will they be scared away at the possibility? of some of their secrets being let out to the public? I think the, it'll be cautious uh, and for a pretty good reason. And again, the thing that I think they want to protect more is the operational capability of the sensor systems and vulnerability of our other military platforms and things that, that are out there. Um, a lot of folks don't know, but in the um, when we were negotiating the space, Treaty. One of the if ET 
you are required to notify the UN immediately for worldwide release, which I know runs counter to every movie and <laughs> whatnot about how it's going to be sequestered. But there is a requirement uh, to, uh, to do that. Uh, now, I think the way they would get around it right now is say, well, we don't know it's ET and whatnot. But the point is that the thinking that went into this in the 60s, and the U.S. is signatory of the uh, says, yeah, you uh, put out the information. And I do think the public, what we do know is, A, the public has a lot of interest. The other piece of it that's critical, in my view, the public also has a lot of information. And mm. so again, you get back into Ozzin, finding what information is in the public domain, I think it would be incredibly useful in uh, attempting to move forward in these areas. Now, I would imagine you're anxiously, you you know, you hope this report comes out and you're anxiously awaiting what's in there. Um, do you have any ideas? I mean, are you kind of pessimistic about it? Do you think that, that it's likely there won't be much? Or um, are you hopeful that, uh, you know, there might be some information and some really good cases that are revealed? Uh, what I would hope is that we see some more of the cases And certainly more recent from 2004. So in the Air Force uh, released a couple of days ago oh, other incidents. Uh, what I would hope there would be is a lot more background uh, on the information. Um, I've got to believe that our space-based systems you know, have data that are there. I mean, we know early on that things were picked up on that, but to pull it together and uh, again, sanitize it in a way that, that the information can be made available, which I think is going to be more useful than uh, sequestering it. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, there's the whole idea, and this topic has come up, uh, even with some of the To the Stars um, people, this, uh, and Elizondo himself, of the possibility of, of crashed uh, objects. So, uh, in particular, Eric Davis, in my last interview with him, said he believes there are programs where they deal, we're dealing with crashed, you know, alien spacecraft. He thinks Roswell was real, and I think he mentioned one other case that might be real, but the other cases he thinks are out there nobody knows about. And Elizondo's only mentioned materials, essentially, but that he thinks they may have materials from anomalous objects. Um, what do you think the likelihood of... of any sort of project like that exists? And do you think we'd find out anything about that? Um, well, here's where I come down, uh, contrary to a number of my good friends uh, who function here, Eric would be one of those, uh, because I do come down against Roswell. I think Roswell is explainable. I think it happened. Um, mm. I think that it did I do think about uh, the materials that they are examining, I'm familiar with some of them, have been, some have been around literally for a couple of decades. Um, and again, certainly interesting, more interesting from not is it unobtainium, but rather the engineering uh, capabilities that are required to you know, be able to do you know, manufacturing at single molecule or single atom level. Um, where that came from, the, one of the problems, even they admit they don't have found the origin, uh, only much later down the line how it came in, into their possession. Um, yeah, uh, like I say, I, when this guy like, you know, Edgar Mitchell was a, a good friend, was over at his house, and we've discussed it uh, many times. Uh, and one of the things I might say that he was very, very clear about is that all of his information, because he was a proponent of the Roswell crash, but that none of the information that came to him uh, when he was with NASA, that this was all stuff that he derived. He was from the Roswell area, had gone to school near there. And he says after he got back, people from the area came and told him stories. and. 
build up from there. Um, but I, I personally think it's explainable, and I know that runs counter again to some of my very good friends, and we debate this hotly. Mm -hmm. Well, I always talk about the best of friends that are interested in this topic uh, rarely have the same point of view or, or same opinions about everything. In fact, I don't know that anybody has the same opinions about every case. Um, well, I think one, one of the problems that we have in the UFO community uh, is that you have these whole mythologies that built up and certain allegiance to it. And if you don't buy the, the particular mythology that that person is putting out, you become the enemy <laughs> as opposed to, no, let's discuss it. Right. Yes. I find myself in that situation currently with a mythology that is out there. Uh, and speaking of Edgar Mitchell, he's related to this because um, kind of, as you said, most of his information was anecdotal, you know, uh, third hand, second hand, uh, but not his own experiences. And one of those is this document called the Wilson document that's out. Allegedly, it is notes from Dr. Eric Davis, who we talked about earlier, um, and that while he was working with Edgar Mitchell some years ago in the 90s, that he had met with this uh, Admiral who Wilson, who yeah. allegedly... Uh, you know, had information where he tried to get in to find out about the crash retrieval uh, um, program and was denied. And this was in your neck of the woods in, in Las Vegas that this occurred. In fact, you were mentioned in these documents. Now, Eric Davis won't comment on them. Wilson has denied it. Uh, another gentleman in here, Commander Miller, who uh, supposedly arranged this meeting, also has denied it. But uh, as far as Las Vegas goes and, and the mentions of you, uh, it talks about the AFIO and that they're the ones who brought uh, Wilson into Vegas. Now, could you explain what that organization was and, and your affiliation with it? Oh, it is. Uh, the uh, Association of Former Intelligence Officer. Uh, we have a local chapter. We did sponsor a, uh, one of the national uh, conventions here was really great. I, I'm actually, I guess technically still am an officer and have written things for uh, APIO that uh, have been published. Uh, what I can guarantee you, when we held the national meeting, A. Wilson was not there, I'm sure, and that this as a topic uh, was definitely not discussed. The only time that I know that Appio actually approached this is in Washington when I was the speaker. Uh, and uh, got, uh, I will say, mixed reviews from, uh, we had, because it was the Washington area, we were able to bring in people who were actually in DIA and NSA and CIA. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just say it was a mix of pleasant but mixed reviews on even, you know, the validity of the topic. Mm hmm Do you get the eyes rolled up? Here goes John on UFOs again. Uh, some of them, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Do you and remember that? I do think that. And getting back to the Wilson I'm um, convinced it was him, and it was Edgar and um, uh, Stephen Greer, uh, where President Miller uh, was involved. Um, and as Wilson said quite accurately, the only reason that the meeting took place was because of who Edgar was. You know, here he is, a famous lunar astronaut, uh, retired Navy captain and whatnot. Had that not taken place, uh, uh, the meeting certainly would not have happened. Uh, I think that's commensurate with what Greer has stated about his briefing uh, to Jim Woolsey, the CIA director, and John Peterson, his wife, and the Woolseys have all denied, no, we went to dinner, and it's very different from a, a formal briefing ceremony. Um, mm. And uh, I, I will say, uh, I actually tried, but I've never spoken to uh, Admiral Wilson uh, on that. But I have seen his adamant denials. 
the story does not make sense. I mean, the background, the setting, and how all of that. Mm -hmm. So, and and you cut out there so uh, for a second. But essentially, they're saying, yeah, yeah. Earlier, Edgar Mitchell, Greer, and and Commander Miller did meet with Wilson, or at least were right. together, and and the topic was brought up, yeah. um, which is supposedly the precursor to this Las Vegas right. meeting with Eric Davis. And uh, it's kind of interesting because in these alleged notes, you know, Wilson is like, I can't believe that Miller or and and these guys are out there talking about our private our previous meeting. Um, yeah, so he's very, he's allegedly in these notes very upset about that. Yet they're the ones who sent Eric Davis to meet him, and then he allegedly continues to spill his guts even more so about this information he allegedly was like upset said, got out in the first place. So What's that? You cut out there, but uh, it just does not make sense from a logical perspective, and what Emma Wilson has put out does make sense. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a couple things regarding you in there. So do you remember in 1997 if the IFI, AFIO ever brought in Wilson? I'm sure not. Mm -hmm. not and then, sure. and he mentions you, it appears, at JA, which, you know, everybody's assuming was you and, and li likely is because you were in those circles as well back then and in Las Vegas. And something that about you can't be trusted, and he read that Howard Bloom book. I mean, <laughs> do you have any idea? Did Wilson know who you were? You said he tried to contact him, and well, he we've never met. Mm -hmm. We have never met. We have more specifically never spoken or whatnot. I'm trying to go with the intermediaries and uh, for, for to answer many of the questions that you're raising, I have, but uh, and, but that was before. The, uh, this famous memo uh, came into the public. I was not familiar with it until I read it on the internet. Somebody sent it around, of course. But uh, certainly, again, not with Appio. I can, can say that for sure. I have to go back and look and see when we actually formed the uh, local chapter. And Howard Bloom, that book, uh he was a New York Times author. He wrote a book out there uh, that is essentially uh, about, uh, supposed to be about you and what we were talking about earlier, you and your colleagues looking for UFO answers. But I was really shocked when I read it because I had already done quite a bit of research. And of course, I had interviewed you probably several times by this point. And the book is completely false. It's got right. everything wrong. Yes. Uh, well, I I will say that uh, 88, 89, somewhere in that time frame, because I was at Los Alamos, and I remember getting a phone call from him, a boom. Uh, we did not have a conversation. There was a guy who was in one of the key meetings, General Jim Fouts, who is mentioned in the book, who clearly talked out of school. Uh, he had been a key individual in something called the, uh, uh, still was a precursor to the National Intelligence Council, but um, it was the integrating agency that takes information forward to the present. It, this was before the days of the DNI. And it was an, an agency, they, they worked under CIA, uh, and it was supposed to integrate the findings between DIA, NSA, CIA, and other agencies. Mm. Uh, what were they called again? You kind of cut out there again. Uh, and he, he was. Uh, oh, you froze there for a sec. Uh, what was the name of that agency? Or that? I think it was National Intelligence Council. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, he was that the director of CIA at the time was the director of Central Intelligence. Now, he was also the director of the Central Intelligence Agency, but this other was a separate entity. And again, it was designed to integrate the responses, much like what became the director of National Intelligence. 
uh, but with broader responsibility after 9-11. A major good move, uh, by the way. But mm -hmm. there was such an agency and uh, Fouts who did uh, talk in there. But you were absolutely correct that almost all of it was just BS. And do you know why that is? Was he given bad information? I, I actually got a hold of him. I asked him if who his sources were. And he said it was so long ago, I forgot. It wasn't that long ago. Uh, I don't know how he could have forgotten that. But um, do you have any idea? I do not remember that um, part of it was supposed to be Hal. And a part of it may, part of it other. And just... Total nonsense, quite frankly, and particularly when he got into the aspects there where he's giving verbatim uh, responsible what happened in meetings. And they, frankly, were meetings that never happened. And of course, he went on uh, early on in the book was to the material, the landing place up to was it was season. Um, you know, some pretty interesting information about that at the time and just totally bogus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so warning for everybody, anybody out there who grabs that book. I think the only, interestingly enough, the only actual interview he cited, because I went through there trying to figure out who his sources might have been, and the only firsthand interview he cited was with Richard Doty, which does not bode well for uh, the credibility of the book. Um, and he certainly had nothing to do with it. Right. So uh, if you guys have questions, uh, be sure to get those out right now. I There is a question here that someone has. Do you think, uh, based on your private prior experience, will the introduction of private companies like SpaceX as primary players in space exploration enhance or further reduce transparency in regards to what is going on in the sky and beyond? It seems like the Elon Musk of the world could be an interesting wild card. Absolutely. Uh, I think will be. And I think it will change dramatically. I think you'll see the same with uh, uh, Galactic, uh, uh, Virgin Galactic. Um, no, I think it, uh, because they have a propensity to, you know, and good reason to bring the information uh, forward. Uh, imagine finding something like that would be great, uh, Ed, advertisement for the uh, civilian uh, company. Um, mm. So I, I think, and we are seeing civilian, I say the United States has basically ceded space to uh, China. Mm. I mean, if you want to look for where things are going to come forth, uh, I think you're probably going to see a lot of the, the Chinese space exploration. Mm -hmm. And the Chinese seem to be, it's, it's hard to say, I haven't done the deep dive, but they're not being completely secretive. They are sharing their discoveries. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm just saying because they're in the budget right now is 0.4% uh, of the federal budget, which is very low. It's, it's a, at least an order of magnitude lower than it was when we were doing the uh, moon project. But what I do know is that the stuff that they're discussing uh, Mars to so returning to the moon, going to Mars, uh, they're much farther behind uh, than what's being let out uh, in the public sector. It's just mm -hmm. high in the sky, and I think they're doing a lot of this gets into political, but I think they're pleasing Trump and, and hoping that that will uh, increase their budget. Uh, but uh, uh, fundamentally, you can't get there from here uh, in the time frame that they're trying to uh, acquire. Right. I mean, they can't even get uh, right now someone, an, an American astronaut into space. Uh, it seems that or into the space station, Elon Musk is is light years ahead of the competition, even Boeing. All right. I think are, did you, you froze yeah. up there for a sec? You did. And I did not hear most of that. All right. Well, I think that's the gist of what I wanted to talk about. Did you have any other thoughts on uh, the, this uh, request for the UAP report? 
Oh, not particularly. I'm looking forward to see what uh, comes out and hope that uh, more of the information does become made public. Mm -hmm. Do you ever get insiders, you know, people who are still enlisted, you know, coming or, or involved with the government, uh, any of these agencies uh, asking for your views and thoughts? Uh, I already retired from Los Alamos in 88. And again, I'm sorry, from the Army in 88 and from Los Alamos in 95. Uh, in fact, I was recently there and could barely recognize the place in Los Alamos there. So, so much has changed. But mm -hmm. uh, I'm not keeping. Uh, for a long time, I was a senior fellow with the Joint Special Operations University. And did uh, tickets and keep the bat on special operations. Uh, the focus was as opposed to my. Uh, and interesting, we we did discuss these things, uh, but they were highly skeptical. Hmm. Well, I've got to say, I think you know, reflecting upon it, uh, you're one of the few people we've had with you know this sort of level of experience and who looked for these answers on the inside that is willing to share that information and has been out, you know, sharing information uh, to people interested in this topic. And now that there, there's more all of a sudden out of nowhere, but uh, you know, I think that, that it's been, you've been uh, a huge help for all of us. I think those of us interested in this to, uh, understand how the government works and, and how all of this would work in conjunction with the government. And I personally feel pretty much everything you've been saying for the last couple decades at uh, these UFO conferences has been, you know, spot on. You obviously know what you're talking about. Thank you. I hope so. <laughs> well, thanks once again. Uh, I definitely will be tapping your intellect again in the future. But uh, thanks so much for taking the time to do this again. Okay, thank you, Alejandro. All right, and thank you, everybody, who stayed and uh, were able to join this live. Thank you for all of those great questions. And uh, we will have more coming up. On Friday, we've got another show. Uh, it's the Friday newscast. But uh, next week, we've got uh, more interviews. In fact, I will be able to talk to Chris Mellon and Louise Elizondo in the next week or so about all of this as well. So we will, uh, this is a great warm up to talk to those guys. So thank you so much, everybody. Thanks, John. Later. We'll talk to you later.